Because life's short. I mean, I look up the other day, you know, I'm like, I'm 56. I'm, like, I'm more than halfway home. I'm not going to live my life worry about dying because I'm going to miss living. And so, therefore, I'm not going to live my life worrying about what happened to me because I'm going to miss living. You know, I was a regular kid. You know, my, unfortunately for us, my parents, uh, they didn't know that they were bringing someone who was a pedophile in. He was the, actually the teenage son of our, our babysitter. I have two younger brothers who are five and six years younger than me. And um, somehow he took advantage of me, uh, had sex with me, had me perform sexual acts, and it was just, uh, was not good. But it created um, a lot of low self-esteem that I, I think I masked very well. Eventually in 1992, I finally told somebody, I'd never said anything for 26 years. And I finally told my wife, which went into a horrible time of panic attacks. I, I'm still healing after 20 years. But one of the things I, I come to grips with, and the one reason I'm doing this, is that I want people to see, one, the impact it has on you for life, but you can also have a good life, though. I mean, I'm a very optimistic person, but there's that part that always dwells back to that negative part. Uh, it's taken a lot of years to realize I am okay, uh, I still have issues feeling as though I let that person get away, too, because I never said anything. Um, as I became an adult, I always wondered, did I let him get away? And that still haunts me. And also, I had to deal with the anger where I didn't take matters into my own hand once I became an adult. And I really had to work on that, too, because there was a time in my life I, I wanted to get even. And that's where my faith and my, uh, my love, and I realized that this wasn't the right thing to do. And I had to forgive. Actually, I think he was actually doing something in, in the bedroom when they were getting ready to go out. Just, I don't know what transpired, but something did. And I remember him and my parents arguing and he left, but they never really dug into it. I mean, this is 1966, so but they never asked me either other than don't let nobody touch you. But they never said, did anything happen? You know, yeah, are you okay? What? So when that happened, I basically shut it down. So I lived my life for a long time. This was my fault. And that's what I mean about how, you're, how you are. You mentally feel dirty and it's your fault. You let this happen. I can't tell my parents because I've already let it happen. They're going to be mad at me. So, you know, you're screwed. That's why I said it's critical how a parent or an adult comes to a child who suspects it. You got to make that child feel extremely comfortable. But I did question early, is that normal? But I never had those desires. I've never had a desire for a guy. So... Fortunately, I learned pretty quick with I was that no, that's not my makeup. But I do believe that's probably why I was so um when I did start dating, uh, I was always wanted to make sure I kept a girlfriend or had two or three. I mean, that was kind of normal. Have one girlfriend and maybe have a couple others I dated just because it kept me feeling secure in my sexuality about what happened to me as a child. In Louisiana, we went to visit my grandparents, and I remember them rushing me to the hospital one night because I said I couldn't breathe, but nothing was wrong. I kind of had another one at 16 where, right before I got my license, so I was 15, turning 16, I started losing all this weight. They couldn't figure out why. You know, I look at that, so I think that was kind of going on. There was nothing wrong. Um, I went through a thing where I was getting dehydrated about 11 or 12. So, in college, I would kind of get lightheaded or dizzy sometime. So I could, when I look back now after having panic attacks and understanding and going through it, I realized sometime my body was trying to react 
and I just was able to deal with it. But the other thing I came to grips with too, I always kept myself super busy, whether sports, something. I really never gave myself what I would call time to sit still at all. Because when I sit still, my mind could run. How it all happened, my wife had a fam, somebody in her family had been sexually abused. We finally found out. So I finally said, well, you know, that happened to me. But I was okay at first. You know, I said, you know, it happened to me as a child. I'm thinking, oh, you know, that wasn't bad. I'm okay, you know. About a month later, well, first what happened, I started feeling like I was no longer in control. Just in general, I kept going, I don't feel like I'm in control anymore of my life. You know, I would say those things to myself. I started feeling out of control. But what was really happening, the panic attack stuff was starting to happen. So I'm driving <clears throat> down Rock Beers Road, I'll never forget. I was on my way to the Y to work out, and I was on the cell phone with a guy. Then all of a sudden, I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, I, I mean, it was horrible. So I called 911. They came, hooked me up, said, man, you're fine. And here's the other thing when I look back now. I went to my doctor. This is 1992. It was an older doctor. He's when, oh, you're under stress. Take some of these pills. You'll be fine. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, stress. Well, I'm still kind of getting through it, not thinking much of it, because I'm like, ah, this is one of those things. And about a month later, I went out of town for a uh, leadership meeting. And my wife didn't go with me I'm by myself. And I'm at this dinner for it's probably 50, 60 of us. Happens again. All of a sudden, I can't breathe. I'm like, man, I'm dying. Can't catch my breath. Panic. Guy takes me to the hospital. Say, you're fine. I spent the night. I was, didn't sleep. I'm starting to get the shakes now. And I had to drive home four hours from uh, Sea Island. Five hours. That was the longest ride of my life because I'm, I'm having them every so often now, driving. I get home, I just like fall apart. Uh, I had trouble driving by myself for a long time because my first one was driving. I had trouble being in a crowd for a while because even today I can't be in the center of a crowd no more. I have to now always be on the outside. I developed some claustrophobia from it. I don't even know if I could play football now and be under a pile just because of that feeling. And I still didn't know what was going on. Then I talked to a, a psychiatrist at my church and she said, you might be having panic attacks or something. <coughs> and I um, talked to a cousin who uh, was a psychologist and she kind of said the same thing. Well, before I talked to them though, I went and had every kind of test you can think of. I mean, I had sleep tests, brainwave tests. I mean, I probably spent, I told my wife, boy, I knew I was healthy because everything was fine. So now I'm really freaking out because I'm like, how can everything be fine? And I'm having these problems. I mean, all of a sudden my muscles would just start tr just twitching uncontrollably. But at the same time, I always say, man, again, that's why I say I was so blessed but I could handle the things I had to in my business. And my business was only, at that time, was only four years old. I mean, that was a real critical point in my business. I mean, again, God just blessed me because I, I couldn't even go in the office and stay more than about an hour or so. I would just, because I would just, and then I had to get on, you know, some medication to try and help. Um, 1992 was, was just horrible. Yeah, I let my kids know, because they were trying to figure out, why is dad crying? I mean, I, I would just cry. I mean, it was horrible. I mean, but I let them know what happened. But I told them in such a way that, you know, as they got older, I told them more. I mean, I really made sure they knew why and what and always talked to us. So we're very, um, we have a very open family. Where there are no secrets. I talk to them, I and you always talk to your kids about people touching you. So I talked to them as probably early as four or five, but I wasn't, I didn't discuss what happened to me until seven, eight, somewhere in there. 
uh, I just told him what transpired, and that's why you have to be careful. That's why I want you to know you can talk to us about anything. Say, no, they can't hurt you. So, you know, I, I made it very clear to them, but I said it in a such a way they knew if something did happen or, ha or did happen, it would not be their fault. We would not do anything to blame them. I think I made it very clear to my kids very early how much I love them, and daddy will do whatever he has to to take care of you. You got to make a kid feel very comfortable that no matter what I tell you, like I tell my my kids, I might be mad at you, but we're going to deal with the situation first. You know, and I'm going to deal with it in a way where I love you and we're going to talk. Because I, like I tell them, I can't replace you. Anything else we can deal with, but I can't replace you. So whatever's going on, we got to talk about it. Any guy who dates... My daughter, I tell them point blank, I got three rules. You don't hit my daughter under no circumstances. No means no. I'm not saying you ain't going to have sex, but no means no. If you hear a grunt, you ain't sure that's no. And uh, you don't disrespect her. I say, I have, if you, as long as you don't break my three rules, we're good. And then I got a gym downstairs. I take them in my gym, and I'll take 50, 60-pound barbells and do arm curls. Now, when they leave, I'm hurting, but I let them, you know, think I'm still, you know, incredibly strong. Um, so I do my own little mind trick, Jedi mind tricks on them, uh, let boys know, you know, I'll do some damage. And, and it's funny because even though I say that, I mean, I'm not going to really do it. I mean, well, it depends what they did. So that's kind of how I did my kids growing up. I allowed them, I mean, I let my kids go spend the night. Now, one of the things I'll say when my daughter was young and my wife was working at midnight on the weekends, sometime girlfriends spend the night, a lot of times I was uncomfortable having a girl, a young girl spend the night because what happened to me, I never wanted to be accused of that because I, that's the other fear. So often they say if that happens to you, you might become an abuser too. And I never wanted anybody to think I would be an abuser because I'm like, man, what I've gone through, I would never do that to another kid. So that's the other part that messes with you too, why you really a lot of times don't want to say anything because there's, there's the stigma that goes with if you've been abused, you're going to be one. So society really kind of makes it tough on another person to kind of come forward because so often that's what you hear. So a lot of um, people who, are, who abuse people, a kid, they're like, oh, well, I apologize. I mean, it only happened once, it only happened twice. I mean, I mean, they're okay, they're over it. So they still think, you know, well, I apologized or I bought them something or, you know, I paid for college or something. Uh, they don't understand the damage they do. Because most of us are who are victims, we don't ever really tell how bad it is. I will live with this for the rest of my life. It'll never be gone. And that's why I have so much uh, compassion for soldiers or people, anybody who lives with post-traumatic stress syndrome. I mean, you do live with it for life, but the other point is you can live. And that's the part I want to make sure is important. This is not a death sentence. It's just a part of your life you have to learn to deal with, learn to control, uh, or learn to accept the triggers. Like I know every so often, I'm going to hit the wall. I just get kind of, I just need to stop, chill out. I just, I'm just kind of pressing and I'm not really going anywhere. And that's why even today I come up like with real athletic challenges like half marathons. Now I'm in the bike and I just came off a hundred mile uh, bike trip plus in California. So I'm always finding things where I had to be disciplined for like six months and push myself physically. And it makes me be alone with myself mentally. Like when I bike sometimes, it could be a two and a half, three hour ride. And I don't even listen to music. I mean, so I'm learning, I'm making myself get comfortable, but I love outdoors. So I have to do things that are outdoors, but in nature, and I see all the beauty 
And like I was riding Sunday and I was thinking about this. But I I'm learn but I'm really getting to a point that I like being alone mentally. For years I never wanted to be alone mentally. So I make these type of physical things because it makes me have to be alone physically and mentally. When you're a child, you don't think about it as much. But I think when you become an adult, and again, I'm only talking from my point of view. I, I don't know how other people feel. But for me, there's no closure. Because I don't know, was he ever punished? You know, did I let him do this to other children? How come I didn't have the courage to speak up so he could have went to jail? So those things eat at you. That's why even revenge it doesn't really work because you still haven't brought closure. Even if I could go get even, that's not going to solve my problem because now I got another issue to deal with. The guilt of what did I do? So to me, the important part is you got to be able to really forgive. And that is forgive yourself. Forgive that person in a way that you can move on. And then you just got to have trust if you don't have the courage to bring them. And I understand that. Um, trying to get justice in the legal system, you just got to let it, you, you, you can't spend your life worrying about getting even. You got to believe in a higher being that's going to handle that. Or as I, you know, or as karma, I mean, it's going to work itself out. First of all, I have a dream for any child who's now, who's been abused, and whether you're an adult or still a child, life is okay. You will get through this. You can make it, regardless of how hard, hard it is right now, life is still good. You still have a reason to live. You still have a reason. Uh, you can make a difference in other people's lives, and you can be very, very successful, and you can have a great family and your own children. To parents of victims, love that child embrace them make them feel whole let them know it's not their fault but also don't blame yourself as long as you really didn't put them in a position like my parents they had no idea you gotta forgive yourself too you you can beat this you can you just you gotta just know you, you gotta believe you can and you gotta have people around you who's helping you too though.